Maru One streamlined process for seasonal workers. An invitation from the Maori Arts and Culture Institute. And Basel wants responsible use of ICT. This is the National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thanks for joining us for Sunday's news. Papua New Guinea needs to improve its processes to engage more seasonal workers in New Zealand. Officials from Eastpac Limited, a leading kiwi fruit exporting giant, says processes in preparing labour recruitment is very slow. National Planning Minister Richard Maru says government agencies will be forced to tighten up the process so more youths can be engaged under the scheme. Eastpac Limited is one of the leading and biggest post-harvest operations in Australasia. It contributes 30% of its produce to the kiwi fruit industry in New Zealand. Nearly 35 Papua New Guineans are working there under New Zealand's recognized Seasonal Workers Employment Scheme or RSE. Um, I start two months now in New Zealand. Some uh, people start six months, three months over start in the back house. Three months over got on a lot of pruning. So now I'm going to start with some of the lumbla and first time lumbla, come with some kind of experience or side of work. Nearly 2,000 workers are recruited around the Pacific. However, for PNG, the numbers continue to be low with 35 the maximum. The PNG government now needs to improve and establish a robust system to prepare seasonal workers. And I think a lot more of our children could be and our youth could be going down to work there, uh, provided we uh, improve the way we administer the scheme. Some of the areas that we learn were things like we are very late in organizing the passports because we are not get able to pay the fees. Things like this, these are very elementary. And I think the time, and uh, interestingly, they, they also told us when we went to the visit, that it's only PNG that has issues, not the other island nations. National Planning Minister and State officials were given a tour to one of Eastpac's packing facility. The kiwi fruit industry is one of New Zealand's leading generated businesses which contributes billion to its economy. Eastpac officers say if processes are effective, more Papua New Guineans can be recruited to work in New Zealand. This is a big area that we've been missing out on and an area that uh, we would like to uh, understand better and see how we can improve that area to get more uh, seasonal workers down to New Zealand. Eastpac is one organization under the RSC scheme which aims to encourage economic development in the Pacific by recruiting seasonal workers every year. <laughs> Jack LaPava Jr. National MTV News. The Maori Arts and Culture Institute has invited Papua New Guinea to attend the New Zealand National Indigenous Conference come October. This would give Papua New Guinea officials the opportunity to establish business networks between the two countries. The invite was extended to National Planning Minister Richard Maurer during the visit to Rotorua. The planning minister and government officials visited the Maori Arts and Culture Institute to tighten the cultural bond between the two nations. Like Papua New Guinea, the Maori culture has its own beliefs and ways of living. The institute aims to preserve the Maori culture and also as different disciplines where students attend classes. The delegation was privileged to visit the carving and weaving school. Two iconic skills embedded in the Maori culture. PNG's High Commissioner to New Zealand, retired PNGDF Commander Francis Agui, was also part of the delegation which toured the institution. The institution has also become a regular tourist attraction. Concluding the visit, the institution has invited PNG officials in the tourism sector to the Indigenous Conference in Rotorua later this year. I would like to invite you, the people of Papua New Guinea, to the National Indigenous Conference here in Rotorua in October. So please, know my heart of might, come and be part of uh, building business and relationships with Papua New Guinea into the future. Kia ora. 
This would be an opportunity for PNG to learn from the institution and establish a similar organization. The planning minister says PNG needs to learn from New Zealand and preserve its tradition and cultures. And uh, I'm sure some that could lead to joint venture companies in Papua New Guinea and other investments that uh, you could uh, make in Papua New Guinea as a result of this gathering. So uh, I want to assure you on behalf of our government, uh, provided we get a formal invitation, our government will, through the government system, organize to, to send a strong delegation from Papua New Guinea to attend the indigenous business conference being hosted here. Nearly 500 tourists visit the institution daily, while PNZ sees fewer than 2,000 a month. Jack Lepave Jr., National MTV News. Papua New Guineans have been urged to appreciate and embrace the 2018 Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum, which will be hosted for the first time in the country. The APEC mission is to promote trade and investment, build sustainable, secure economic growth, improve living standards and support economic and technical cooperation within the 21 member economies. Already, several high-level meetings have been held so far in Port Moresby, which saw senior officials from other member economies visiting the country. The APEC initiative is to turn policy goals into concrete results and agreements into tangible benefits. Communication Minister Sembasol says people in Papua New Guinea must be responsible when using information and communication technology services. Minister Basel said he has directed his ICT line agencies to research on how best to protect privacy of social media users in PNG. Basel made these remarks, these remarks when he registered his SIM cards recently. In an interview with the communications minister earlier last month, Mr. Basil said the introduction of internet services in Papua New Guinea has brought with it many challenges. This includes the high reported cases of abuse of ICT services. Given the high statistics, Basil said the communications ministry is working on minimizing this. You have to be responsible because internet, uh, you know internet, but Facebook and all other social media, it's a very powerful uh, uh, form of communication where plenty man marry Papua New Guinea, but you must uh, make sure that you may use him the right way. PNG now has an estimated two million people with Facebook accounts. And to protect these millions of users, the communications ministry has taken steps to improve our cyber security. Make him all this block and have you broke him all cyber security laws by me plug and trace him all up where me look him all some all mobile company or you walk like kiss him photo blow man identification blow man law behind time time you make and trace him all and cyber security law is up you can all him all this plan and bring him come law law. Thakla Gunga National MTV News. The impact of Papua New Guinea's economic downturn continues to plague rural schools all over the country. Land Primary School, located in the interlands of Lasul Binding LLG in East New Britain province, is one that is struggling to operate. The school's headmaster, Norman Langu, says the much talked about TFF funding and other subsidies promised by the government are yet to reach them. Edwin Fidelis reports from Kokopo. Land Primary School is one of the most remote schools in East New Britain province, providing education to about 180 students. It is located in the hinterlands of Lansul Binding local level government towards the east and west New Britain's provincial border. To get to land, it will take about an hour on the boat or about three hours on a four-wheel drive vehicle from Karavat, the nearest township. A combination of high freight cost bad road conditions and limited government support has remained a regular struggle for the school. From this lookout you can see the coast. This is where most of the school supplies for land primary school land before they are transported inland. To get to this lookout from the coast it will take about two hours on foot. The headmaster of land primary school Norman Lago tells me it is a growing pain for his teachers and students in the last five years. 
even with long time lo kasi mol materials too time ko ko purchase si mol solution plata mol lo kipka and then from there we have to hire groups or get the parents to walk down karem kago uko bat kamanta long shift mol ka kago kam lo school and be take him around one week especially one time mol building materials until recently, a road was built into the area, funded by the World Bank through its PPAP project to assist cocoa farmers to have access to cocoa markets. The road has at least is their pain of transportation, but it doesn't dictate how the school is to be managed. look forward long. The struggles faced by the school is made even worse when the March talked about TFF funding promised by the government never comes. And there are more students enrolling every year than before with little amount of money available to keep the school running, the headmaster says. Since this law get a money me plus suppose no kissing me play no kissing straight. But the struggle for Mr. Langu and his eight teachers have become a normal way of life for this remote government-run school. The school's board of management says they have refocused and will only spend on priority areas in order to save money and avoid any possible closure. Parents of students continue to do regular fundraising, the master says, and this is to help make money to meet the operational expenses for the school. Lan Primary School provides a tiny glimpse into the harsh realities about the struggles facing rural schools all over the country. Almost all the education policies made in Waigani over the years haven't reached them yet. Edwin Fidelis, National MTV News, Kokopo. You're with National MTV News. We go for a break now, but we'll have more stories when we come back. Stay tuned. Welcome back. A Chinese businessman was arrested and charged for attempting to bribe a police detective involved in an ongoing investigation into a human trafficking case. The suspect, Chi Yuan Chui of Shandong Province, is the managing director of A&D Consultancy Limited. According to police, Mr. Chui offered 10,000 kina cash to the officer in charge at the Godens Police Station Minor Crimes Unit. However, the police officer, Senior Sergeant Terry, referred the matter to police detectives. The Chinese national was locked up at the broker's cells but later released on court bail. Chui is the main suspect in an ongoing police investigation for allegedly falsifying documents and bringing foreign nationals into the country. Police also confiscated over 200 common seals belonging to various Chinese companies in Chui's possession. After five years of struggle with poor water supply, the village of Kirakira in central province has received 49 water tanks. Councillor Alu says the initiative is one of many other necessities required in the community. This follows a partnership with the Office of the Mosby South Electorate. The 49 water tanks received by the village will be distributed among 108 houses. Four households will share one water tank that holds up to 2,000 litres of water, while other individual households will receive 1,000 litres of water tanks each. We face a lot of uh, challenges and uh, problems uh, this, in my last five-year term. Uh, you know, the, our village children and the mothers taking the containers and going out to the uh, uh, main taps and you know, horse camps and suburban market and there's walking around and just looking for the water. And I've seen that this is the uh, leader should do uh, do something for his people. That's why I'm getting uh, uh, 49 uh, tougher tanks for my people. The joint project costed 49,000 kina. With the project being the first of its kind in the village, other necessary projects will be looked into so that the community can benefit in one way or another. With the expansion of the city, it's a challenge the village will face, especially with living standards, to shift from village setting to city standards. 
Alu highlighted that with land being an issue, negotiations will be carried out with the Lands Minister and member for Mosby South to settle land entitlements. Trying to do something for especially our land. Huh? Our land is very important. That's why uh, Minister Justin is uh, giving me the opportunity to go in uh, in the PNG Land Board. Uh, I'm also in the PNG Land Board. And it's honor and privilege to, for the people of Motukoita too. Uh, we're trying to give them opportunity and hope for our people that we're trying to get our, our land back. Uh, so we trying to, uh, this is our opportunity, you know, and we're trying to uh, sit down and uh, organize ourselves, especially the ILGs and uh, uh, clan leaders and everybody to work together and forget our differences and to get those opportunities. Uh, that's why we are we're trying to work to our ministers. Plans to also engage the community with APEC will also be discussed. We discussed with the minister already. Uh, he will give us an opportunity to uh, engage all our village uh, boys and girls to uh, this APEC meeting. Uh, specifically for uh, uh, culture dance and uh, uh, tourism, uh, we trying to organize everything for. Godwin Eki, National MTV News. Hula Health Center in the Central Province has run out of basic medicines. A recent visit by Voices for Village Foundation revealed the situation with health officers cautious of medical distribution. The health center serves around 10,000 people in the Rigo Coast LLG. For a small facility to serve about 10,000 people from not just in the Rigo district but the surrounding villages is a struggle, especially when the health facilities are understaffed, lack basic health equipment and funding and with no basic drugs such as antibiotics and painkillers. Our present clinic is going on but at, at the moment we don't have any drugs mm. like uh, babies uh, amoxicillin and septrin suspension, panadol, mm. even the adult medicine, too, we don't have them. Mm. And so we have a little bit of uh, a crystal pen that we give to the babies when they have high fever mm. with like cough and running nose and uh, chest infection. Many times patients are turned away. Those who can afford to come to Port Mosby do so, but for many, it's something they have come to learn to live with. We ran out of medicine so many times that we are turning back the sick people, which is not very good. <coughs> Otherwise, the patients are coming, we should all attend to them, but because of no medicine, we are turning them away, and sometimes maybe they go to Mosby. Just recently, Voices for Villages Foundation donated vital materials for the hospital to use. The items included beds, linen, basic medicinal kits, and many others. Spokesperson Van Inade says many times rural health facilities are overlooked. Most of our rural aid posts have been neglected, and that's where majority of our people stay, and they enjoy the villages. And, and of course, um, coming to town is very expensive. Vani and her organization from the Voices of Villages have come to the health center's aid and will be assisting them with drugs that will be flown into the country in the coming days. The sister in charge at the aid post was, was uh, very um, grateful for what we're doing and also expressed the concerns of, you know, uh, medicine not there, not available for them to serve. And it's also heartbreaking for her as well as a sister. She's unable to help her people. So, and it's also heartbreaking too. So, and that's the whole reason why we came back and we are partnering with, you know, a people to um, supply medicine. So we should be having a 40 foot container arriving so we can go back and help the aid post. Stacy Yalo, National MTV News. As part of its corporate and social responsibility, Bank South Pacific donated solar lights to Kukila Secondary School. The lights will allow the students to study in the night and complete other educational activities. Gordon Eki with this report. 
Solar lights in the schools will help students as well as increase the number of intakes into tertiary institutions. According to a survey done in 2010 in India, the impact of solar light raised average study hours from 1.5 hours to 2.7 hours, which can have similar effect in PNG. Over the last eight years, BSB completed 336 community projects across PNG, investing 7.8 million kina, focusing on libraries, playgrounds, shelters, health, water, sanitation, and education. The installation uh, of solar lights and painting the ablution blocks demonstrates our commitment and dedication to ensuring our projects delivered make the greatest difference to the students, the school, and the community as a whole. With this year's theme being solar lights in high schools, it should address issues such as lack of government funding to schools remain a concern, reduce purchase of electricity cost for schools, use of kerosene as a source of light that is a health hazard, and by introducing solar will be beneficial to the students, and finally introduce night studies with the help of solar-powered lights. In solar lights uh, projects, uh, to be undertaken by BSP. For the students themselves, or the recipients of, and the users of these um, lights that will be provided, let's have some civic pride. So you, you will note that community is part of, of our vision statement as well. So we do take the community initiatives very seriously. Supporting the education of students is one of the most effective ways of breaking the cycle of disadvantage and ensuring students can access the same learning opportunities as their peers. It's our great privilege for receiving us uh, such students in our schools because previously we have, we have been struggling in some areas in studies because in, especially we are using PNG power and it's sometimes when we are studying it's blackout and it's good for us to receive in solar lights especially. Through our studies these two Sometimes they used to call us to our studies, but there's no light. We cannot do our, do our um, private studies properly. And when we attend to uh, receive, this, uh, receive this kind of work and receive the solars. This holistic and long-term support will give the youths of Papua New Guinea and the region the assistance they need to develop vital life skills, be healthy, stay engaged in their education, and have the best chance to realize their potential. BSP will continue to visit schools in remote areas where electricity is a major setback that is affecting the studies of many young Papua New Guineans. This signifies the launching of solar project here at Quinkina Secondary School by BSP. Godwin Eki, National MTV News. Social Democratic Party held its third national convention this week with its members from around the country. The convention aimed to ensure a strong, resilient Social Democratic Party by evaluating past year's experiences and planning for the future. The convention started on Friday and ended today. Over the past three days, members of Social Democratic Party from 21 provinces gathered at the Sejon Gai Stadium to discuss and evaluate their performances and to plan for the coming years. We a solution to all these kind of issues facing all of us. We will put in whatever need to be done aside. As the we join the new meeting, we must be a party of solution. Not join the crowd and just point out the problem, but we must be a party of solution. This is a big challenge facing members of parliament and what will align with the law all over the country. This is the third national convention for this party and members were challenged to create awareness and training on party documents for citizens to understand in order to make informed decisions. Our whole aim is that we want to prepare ourselves, organize ourselves to be in the party to 2022 for our next uh, coming election. The Slato am giving me people most inspiring people and I'm challenging people uh, so that people are looking for He got opportunity, he got good people road block, people can move forward the next plan, the party. The party has also included women to participate in decision making as well. 
Unfortunately, like every other party, we have ma more male uh, uh, delegates here than uh, female uh, delegates, but that doesn't mean that uh, this party does not give significance or importance to the issues affecting women of this nation. We do. Uh, we believe in the rights of women. Enjoy the um, uh, rights that every other human, human being has. Uh. Stacey Yalo, National MTV News. The Port Moresby Flame Cake Bake Off saw four participants baking off in front of a live audience at Lamana Gold Club today. The second Bake Off Challenge was not only about baking, but also an opportunity for some business houses to display their local products as well. It was a family event today at Lamana as families gathered to watch the second Flame Bake Off. Four contestants, Jackson Bay, Jennifer Gideon, Naomi Lirori, and Julie Semeku went head to head in a two hour long baking challenge. We were supposed to have 10 contestants this morning, but um, six, uh, our six other contestants pulled out, so we were left with four now. Finishing an hour ahead of time, all contestants were judged on their ability to use the baking equipment, the texture of the food, color, originality, and four other criteria as well. I choose to bake uh, mini cheeseburger rolls. I haven't tried it before, it's my first time, and also my first time to bake in public. Baking is it's part of my life, I, I'd say. I love baking. Head judge and chef of IEA College of TAFE, Marlin Tomausi, was impressed with the overall performance of the contestants and declared them all winners. At the moment, you can see that what she has is what has been given to her to use. And so we give her a round of applause on that one. We found it impossible to pick it clean well. So you are all going to be awarded in exactly the same prize because you are all winners. All contestants were presented with a certificate of participation, cash prize of 150 kina each, and other complimentary prizes as well. Stacey Yellow, National MTV News. Stories making headlines overseas when we come back. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the news. Turning overseas, concerns over air and water quality are growing in Hawaii as the impact of the Kilauea volcano eruptions worsen. Lava continues to spread into residential areas and authorities have now imposed water restrictions on the Big Island as the toxic gases and lava flows could make the water supply unsafe. The spewing lava and toxic gases are showing no signs of slowing down. Oh my God. A powerful 6.9 magnitude earthquake struck the Big Island on Friday, the largest in 43 years. Hey, you guys okay? Since then, several new eruptive cracks have opened up in the residential community of Leilani Estate. Crazy. Each hundreds of yards long, splashing lava into the air and flooding streets. Two houses have burned so far and thousands evacuated. The smoke is really getting thick and you can really smell it in the air. Herschel Hood tried to convince his neighbor to leave with him. He just refuses to go. I've been to him twice today and he just won't leave. This part of the Big Island has seen some major lava flows before. This one happened in 1955. It went all the way to the ocean. That smoke back there is where the new eruption is. Kilauea is the youngest and most active volcano on the Big Island. Just a few miles from the current lava flow at a community meeting, authorities tried to explain the unpredictability of the volcanic cracks. All of a sudden one opened up, steam started coming out, and the red lava. That's how fast it was happening. Talmadge Magno, administrator for Hawaii County Civil Defense, says at least six active fissures have opened up so far. You know, we're starting to see a pattern, a kind of a line. And it could continue happening. Yes. And we really don't know how long. Yes, that's the sad part about it. It could be happening for a long time. Or on the other end, like I said, mysteriously, you could just end. There is definitely still a lot of volcanic activity here. We felt several earthquakes last night, and water is now becoming an issue. Authorities are urging people to restrict usage as lava approaches one of the major water mains in the area. 
Riot police have seized Russia's most prominent opposition leader, Alexei Navalny, at a Moscow rally protesting against Vladimir Putin's inauguration. At least a thousand more activists were also arrested, protesting Mr. Putin's fourth term as the president. In Moscow, this was the reaction to a protest against the president. Hey, 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 hey. Riot police pushed demonstrators off Pushkin Square. The protesters had been shouting down with the Tsar and demanding that Vladimir Putin serves his fourth term as president in jail. There were protests in dozens of Russian towns. Police detained more than a thousand people. Do we need a Tsar? asked opposition activist Alexei Navalny, who'd organized the protest. No, they shouted. Soon after, Police dragged him away, too. Earlier on the square, Russian nationalists supporting President Putin vowed to prevent a Ukraine-style revolution in Russia. The anti-government protesters shouted them down. On paper, at least, Vladimir Putin has little to fear from a street protest. A recent survey found that the vast majority of Russians have no desire to take part in political demonstrations. And yet, any public display of dissent makes the Russian government nervous. And that is because the Kremlin has seen people power force political change in countries on Russia's doorstep. Hence, this less than subtle hint from those in power here that critics of the authorities can expect an even tougher time in President Putin's fourth term in the Kremlin. Australia is about to shoot for the stars with the government announcing a $50 million funding boost to establish a new space agency. There's now discussion over which state will host the headquarters and launch sites for satellites. In the race to space, Australia's long strived for takeoff. Erection was completed, the umbilical cord was attached. At the start of lunar exploration, Australia was there. How do you reckon they go to the... up there? Its contribution even celebrated on the big screen. You'll be able to hear Armstrong talking to Houston? Yeah, just by hitting a couple of buttons there. But without a dedicated space agency, there are fears this country has fallen well behind. We can do anything as long as we have some support. And one of the lacking things is this big infrastructure. Now a long-awaited boost is coming, courtesy of next week's budget. The ABC has learnt the government will unveil a $50 million package to launch Australia's first space agency. Australia is at the perfect time to jump in and grab part of this market because it is changing. A decision is yet to be made on where the new space agency and launch sites will be based, but the private sector will be required to take a leading role. We can be putting things into space, and we should be. We're well-placed geographically for communications and for launch sites, and we're well-placed for creativeness in our people, and that's what you want in a space agency. The government believes space could be the next big industry for Australia. A NASA mission to study the composition of Mars has begun a six-month journey to the planet. The rocket is carrying a probe which is discussed to help scientists find out about what's beneath Mars' crust. Two, zero. Right on time, shrouded in fog, at 4.05 a.m. local time, the Atlas V rocket carrying NASA's Mars InSight lander launched from Vandenberg Air Force Base on the Californian coast. Miles, current velocity, 4,542 miles per hour. This, the U.S. space agency says, is not just another mission to the Red Planet, but a journey back in time. Probing beneath the surface of Mars for the first time, InSight will aim to take the pulse of the planet to work out how it formed more than four and a half billion years ago. Centaur continues to look excellent at this point. Thanks. Once it's unfolded its vital solar panels, the robotic lander will carefully put down its own scientific instruments, which will map the deep structure of the planet. These will take the temperature of Mars and analyze the structure of its core. One instrument, a seismometer, will pick up signals from Martian earthquakes or Mars quakes. Unlike previous missions, uh, the most recent missions have been looking for water and habitability. This particular one is looking at how the planet itself is made up, how it's built.
Earth and Mars formed at the same time, probably by similar processes. So this mission could also shed light on why the two planets are so different. Beyond a trip to Mars, scientists say this is a mission to our solar system's past. Peering beneath Mars' surface could also help us understand how Earth, the Moon, and even distant exoplanets around other stars evolved. Shearer is across New Zealand is struggling to keep up with demand in what some say is the worst labor shortage they've ever seen. Trained Kiwi shearers are chasing higher wages across the Tasman, prompting contractors to look at lifting pay in New Zealand, but that could hit farmers hard. You'll struggle to find a harder day's work than in a wool shed. There's no doubt it is hard work. You know, they spend eight hours actually you know, bent over a sheep and actually sweating. And those wanting to do it are growing harder to find. It's as bad as it's ever been really, even though we've got the less sheep numbers. Um, we've certainly got, you know, um, shortage of young people coming into the industry. In this Hawke's Bay shed, more migrant workers are filling stands than ever before. A third of my shearers this year were overseas shearers, yeah. In 2012, only 17 work visas were granted for shearers from overseas, but that number has been steadily increasing and last year it rose to nearly 60. That's as more Kiwi shearers leave our shores for greener pastures in Australia. They're paid probably around about 30% more. To compete, shearing contractors are considering lifting wages for workers here. It's just straight economics, like they feel more it's like anybody, if they're paid a little more, they feel more appreciated. Those costs would likely be passed on to farmers already battling low prices for strong wool. We have situations at the moment where it's costing more to get the wool off the sheep than what the returns are. So uh, a lot of farmers aren't going to be happy about this, but the fact is it's inevitable. Sheep numbers have halved in the last 15 years with high meat values keeping the iconic industry alive. If this continues for another three or four years, we may have reached a uh, point in the country's history where sheep may not be the future. For now, the future's bright for prospective sharers as demand for workers continues to outstrip supply. National MTV News will be back with some sporting action in Chukai Sports. Stay tuned. Tukai Sports. Welcome to Chukai Sports. Five of six track and field athletes left for Vanuatu today to attend the Melanesian Athletics Championship. The athletes are in the development squad for next year's 2019 Pacific Games. Team coach and manager Nabase Dwaba says this will be the first international event for the junior athletes. All in the development squad, the tournament in Vanuatu will be used as part of the athletes' preparations for next year's Pacific Games. All of them, except Moen Boino, which is the five of them, this is their first time to travel overseas and uh, Athletics Pins is giving them the opportunity to be exposed to such an event like this. He believes the athletes have the potential to do well. We have the youngest uh, with us, is Mary Gertrude, uh, she'll be taking part in the uh, in the 3,000 meters and also the 5,000 meters in the open division. And also uh, Mary uh, Tenge, she's taking part in the 1,500 meters and, uh, and the 5,000 meters also. And from there we also have our uh, young uh, uh, 800 meter runner, uh, uh, Lien Tibu. She's going to also be taking part of the events that she'll be running will be the 800 meters and the 1,500 meters. And uh, Isila, Isela Apkuk uh, should be taking part also in the 200 meters and of four. All seven will be banking for inspiration and morale boost from track and field veteran Moiwen Boino, who's participating in the 100 and 400 meter hurdles. Uh, Linus, Linus uh, Koravi is uh, running in the sprints in the 100 meters and the 200 meters open. And also our young athletes, uh, who also the winner of the 200 meter in the PNG Games, uh, Frederick Ageda, is currently most be based athlete, is also taking part in the 100 meters and the 200 meters. And of course, to run up the group, uh, we have our veteran uh, runner, uh, Moen Boino. 
Meanwhile, this year's National Athletics Championships will also be used to identify top track and field athletes for next year's Pacific Games and other upcoming regional and international fixtures. And also this Melon uh, Athletics Championship is uh, also one of the main international events that they're using for their young juniors to qualify for the Argentina Youth Olympics. Godwin Eki, National MTV Sports. PNG International Justin Olam today became Storm player number 187 in his debut appearance for the Melbourne Storm against the St. George Illawarra Dragons this afternoon. This adds another chapter to the 24-year-olds who becomes just the second player from Papua New Guinea to play for the Melbourne Storms. Marcus Bai was the first, having been part of the inaugural Storm side in 1998 and going on to have an illustrious career that saw him score 70 tries in 144 games for the club. Now, 20 years later, Olam took his place in the Storm side after being named in the centres in the clash against the top of the table Dragons. Olam joined Melbourne last year after catching the eye of Storm recruiters whilst playing for the PNG Hunters in the Queensland Cup. Despite losing 34-14 to to the Dragons, Olam recorded four line breaks, pulled off a try-saving tackle with one try assist and played the full 80 minutes of first grade footy. To football and the popular school soccer here in the nation's capital has contributed a lot to discipline among students. School fights in NCD used to be one of the main issues parents and schools deal with in the previous year. But it seems school soccer has now provided a better battlefield. You know, we have in Port Mosby, we have uh, school fights. Now I, I'm seeing with this competition for the last two years, we have seen a change in attitude. Uh, students begin to respond positively and take responsibility over their actions. So, um, if people are out over there who needs a good, peaceful community and support us through these means, not only uh, helping the kids to play soccer, but community relationships that we build it. And uh, we also have a policy that you can only participate in the school soccer if, if you are in school. If you are outside on the street, there is no game for you. NCD Governor Paul Pakop today presented a cheque of 100,000 kina to NCD Rugby Union Association to support the competition. The funds will also be used in priority areas such as medical kits, fees for officials and also assist teams travelling to this year's Rugby Sevens World Cup tournament in San Francisco, USA. And I'm happy today to make a presentation of 100,000 on behalf of uh, NCDC and our members of parliament. This is a small start to uh, supporting, you know, rugby in our city and at the national level. I would say this is a real blessing. Uh, this association, NCD, NCDRU uh, Association, is a very young, it's just a year old. Uh, last year was tough. It was tough because of the economic and all those uh, business houses not coming in, not willing. It was tough. We had to dig the executive. We had to dig in our own personal pockets, huh? our family money to run, run, run the association. It's, it's not for just for our own gain, but to put smile on the young kids, the grassroots. Huh? Uh, sports is another avenue uh, to exile in life. Uh, it's not just the academic, but in sports too. Some people are smarter, uh, some people they have talent in, in sport. With the 100,000 uh, sponsorship money, it buys the right for the, uh, naming rights. And so we've called our men's competition the Pack Up Cup and our women's competition Walk for Life Pearls Cup. Don't go away, more sporting action in Chukai Sports right after the break. <laughs> True Kai Sports. Welcome back to True Kai Sports. The Easy Loan AFL competition saw eight teams compete in the men's junior and A grade division. In the junior division, the first match was against Lamana Dockers and West Eagles. Despite having equal amount of experienced players on board, it was the West Eagles who managed to seal a victory with a 20 point win. Godwin Eki reports. Taking off to a scintillating start, it was Lamana Dockers up against the West Eagles. With no difference in height, it was hard to get hold of the ball as both teams shared possessions minute by minute with few opportunities. 
But having a few international players in both sides, the game was equally played. It was the West who managed to score their first goal. But it wasn't long before Lamana Dockers returned the favour. In the second and third round, both teams scored equal numbers of behind, but West Eagles extended their lead by one goal. In the last quarter, the defence was tough as both teams counted on their forwards. But with the fast-flowing game by West Eagles, they managed to score one more behind, bringing their final score at full time to 25, leaving the Dockers behind with 14 points. Uh, also, uh, the bulk of the PNC Mosquitoes players are based here in Mosby as well. So, yes, the competition, you know, with uh, that kind of standard being introduced by the boys, we see the competition getting, you know, tougher. With, like we said earlier, with the young kids coming on, they tend to, you know, learn from the qualities of the international players. Then it gets better. So, yeah, definitely it's, it's good with having the international players here in the competition and a big number of them definitely will improve you know, our game further, so yeah. In the other match, in the main game, it was between the Bomana Cats and North Waigani. Godwin Eki, National MTV Sports. And that's a wrap for Chukai Sports. Stay tuned for weather details coming up next. Chukai Sports. <laughs>The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. For the forecast for the southern region, a shower or two expected all across the region in Port Moresby, Daru, Kerama, Alutau and Popendita. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. And that's been the new sports and weather for today, Sunday, 6th of May 2018. Until next time, from the entire news crew, have a safe week ahead. Good night.